Hello and welcome to another episode of the Express Economist. This is possibly uh, the most important episode we've done till now for two reasons. One, the topic of the day, where we will discuss um, Indian women and the Indian economy and the role that Indian women play in the Indian Indian economy. Um, in the in the recent uh, uh, Independence Day speech, uh, Prime Minister Modi has uh, yet again talked about two very crucial things. One was uh, the issue about uh, India wanting to become a developed country in the next 25 years. And the other big issue was, uh, to my mind, the, uh, the point that he made about men uh, treating women uh, in a better manner uh, and, and, and the, you know, the, the way we treat our women in the country in a better manner. Now, Mr. Modi has said uh, similar things in the past, and these are unexceptionable things like Beti Bachao, Beti Padhao, and he's also in the past talked about how, we, uh, how men treat women in the country. So uh, I want to link both the things. One, the uh, uh, status of women in this country and their involvement in the economy and how, what are the links there. Uh, the other reason why this show is important is, is for the guest economists we have. Uh, please welcome Professor Jaiti Ghosh, uh, who's the Professor of Economics at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Um, Professor Ghosh, very grateful that you could take time out and be on the show. Um, very delighted to have you. Thank so, you. It's a pleasure. So um, uh, let's kickstart this uh, uh, discussion with the, with the first thing that often gets talked about, which is about, um, you know, in economic terms, the female labor force participation rate. Essentially, um, it's a metric that shows how many women in the working age population are sort of seeking work. And in India, this metric, uh, no matter which way one sort of calculates this, is uh, abysmally low. Um, and it gets often quoted uh, in media, um, reflective of where Indian women stand vis-a-vis -vis the economy. And uh, we'll pull up a chart uh, on the screen, which can show that, uh, you know, no matter which way one cuts it, you know, uh, it's not just a matter about high income countries or low income countries, middle income countries or, you know, uh, conflict uh, afflicted uh, uh, countries. India's uh, uh, female participation uh, rate in the labor force is quite low. It's below Pakistan. Many of uh, uh, even even Afghanistan in one of the you know in, in the data that shows. And these uh, this is quite uh, quite poor. So my first question, uh, Professor Ghosh, is uh, how how do you sort of see this uh, 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 this uh, particular data and why do women or how do women lose out um, in the Indian economy? Um, if you could reflect a bit on that. Yes, absolutely. Udit, you're so right to link these two women's status and economic participation, because in fact, it's a very good indicator. The labor force participation rate or the employment rate, you know, the work participation rate is a very good indicator of women's status and in economy or in society. So you find across the world where you have higher work participation rates of women, there is generally a better sense of gender empowerment or gender equity along many other indicators. Well, India is remarkable in many ways. One, you, as you pointed out, we have a really low participation rate, both in terms of labor force, that is how many women are willing to work, and in terms of work participation, how many of them are actually engaged in work for pay, employment, if you like. And it turns out that we are abysmally low, yes, but we are lower than, you mentioned Afghanistan, Saudi Arabia, some of the countries with the lowest status of women in the world. We are below that currently. So that's one very striking feature about India. The other very striking feature, which makes us unusual, in fact, unique, is that in a period of very rapid growth from the early 1990s onwards, this but work participation rate actually fell. Now, this is completely different from all the dynamic Asian economies, you know, East Asia, Southeast Asia, et cetera, where when they had their very rapid period of growth, work participation rates of women doubled 
in one generation. It was the opposite. In other words, pretty much every country that has experienced rapid industrialization, export-oriented growth, and all of that has shown a massive increase in women's work participation. In India, ours actually declined from about 34, 35% in the early 90s to as low as 18% and even lower now. That's unbelievable, actually. When you look, when most economists hear this, they say, no, no, you, it can't be true. There must be some problem with the measure. But of course, it has huge implications. And we can talk about why, and I'm happy to go into yeah. the why, but I just want to talk about the implications for a minute. Yeah. So what does it mean? It actually means, first of all, that it's not that women are not working. It's just that they're not recognized as working. So that's one very, very big part. A large part of what women do is not recorded as work. So we have a massive existence of unpaid work in our economy. And we now have Chinese data from 2017-18 that tells us that the bulk of this is performed by women. And that the women who we call not working, if you looked at the full NSS definition of work, where you include what are called scope 91 and 92, that is when you're engaged in household work, they call it household duties, where you're engaged in work, you know, for looking after people, cooking, cleaning, care, all of those things. And if you include that plus other activities, fetching water, fetching fuel, wood, kitchen gardening, poultry raising, tutoring your children, you know, making baskets, sewing clothes, all of the things. Uh, if you include all of those, which are all economic activities, really, then it's not just 18% of Indian women who are working. It's more like nearly 90. It's like 88% of women are working. It's just that that huge hundreds of millions of workers are not recognized as workers. So this existence of unpaid work, what does it do? It has many terrible implications. Even the work that women do is not then fully recognized when they do economic activity. So all the things I mentioned to you are potentially economic activities. You can hire people to do that, that work. If you hire them, it becomes economic. If it's done at home by the women and girls, suddenly it's not economic activity. Okay? So that's number one. The work is not recognized. Even our own data, you know, we say we have only 18% of women working. Around one third of that, 31% of them are engaged as unpaid helpers in family enterprises. So they're not paid. They're just recognized to be working. One third of those whom we say are working for pay are not working for pay. They're working in their farms, in their shops, in whichever, but they don't get any individual remuneration. Now that in turn means that it prevents women from participating in other work going out and looking for work. That's why we have a low labor force participation rate because women are too busy doing the other work. They have to look after people. They have to do fetch water. They have to do all the other zillions of activities that take many hours in a day. So they're not able to go out and seek employment. That's one major impact. But the other is that when they do seek employment, society tends to undervalue them. When women are much more engaged in unpaid work, you will find that society has a very high gender wage gap because society knows you can get these women to work for free. So really, they, they don't need to be paid much when they enter the workforce. So we have a very high gender wage gap in India. The average, on average, women's wage is only about 60% of the male wage across all activities. But then it also means that they get clustered in these certain occupations, which are the kinds of things they are seen to be doing otherwise. So it's a lot of relatively unskilled work in what are called the basic economic activities and basic industries. It's a lot of care activities. And so they get clustered in these low wage occupations. And then even the men who do those jobs get low wages. There's a wage penalty for anyone mm -hmm. who is a nurse, an attendant a caregiver, you know, et cetera. So that's another implication. But then there is, in fact, the fact that, yes, of course, this impacts women. It reduces your economic power. It reduces your ability to bargain within the household. It, you have less mobility because you're stuck doing all of this unpaid work. You're much more under the control of other family members, basically men, father, brother, husband, whoever, sometimes even son. But it's also... In a sense, you said, how is it bad for the economy? We can talk about that. But you know, the formal economy is a big beneficiary. This is a huge 
subsidy to the recognized economy. All this unpaid work is actually contributing to the recognized economy, even though it's not recognized. If you like, it's a giant freebie to the organized economy. The, the word freebie is very popular nowadays. This is the biggest freebie we have in India. It's the unpaid work of mostly women to the economy as we know it. So I just wanted to, there's a fantastic, the way you explained it uh, in, in, in how it sort of impacts women um, and beyond the economy uh, and, and the issue of freebie uh, uh, needs to be understood more broadly. The one term that gets talked about a lot about women is that they don't have agency. And, uh, you know, that even in the prime minister's uh, construction of it, that uh, men should, you know, maybe treat women uh, better. The agency perhaps lies with, with the men. Can you speak a bit about what is agency? You know, viewers might yes, might understand absolutely. That. You know, that's a, that's absolutely an ideal point because the absence of agency is the essence of patriarchy. I mean, patriarchy is all about controlling women's labor. Actually, that's if the bottom line about patriarchy is the ability to control women's labor. Their labor in all kinds of ways, within the family, in terms of reproductive work, you know, having babies, looking after them, then caring for everybody else in the household. All of that me means if you want to ensure that you can keep women doing this, that you have to deny them agency. And allowing them to work outside and, and enabling them to get their own incomes means that they will get some agency. It's true, you can still try and take away all that income and so on, but there is this ability to go outside, there is this ability to meet others, there is this ability to feel some value intrinsic to yourself, mm -hmm. all of which are very dangerous mm -hmm. for that patriarchal relationship. So the denial of agency is absolutely fundamental. So linked to that, I would like to ask you, you know, you know that India has such a starkly low um, uh, employment uh, uh, worker employment ratio or, or or labor force participation ratio for women and in fact as you said you know since 2005 we've seen a sharp decline so for the phase where since the we, 1990s yeah even 1990s yeah so there's even at the phase when we are actually uh, growing faster on the face of it women are not taking part in that so you know part formally in that now so why has this happened or, you know, why does it continue to happen? If you could reflect a bit on that, you know, I, I, I just want to uh, recall something that uh, uh, Mr. Mohan Bhagwat said in 2013 that, you know, he talked about a compact between ma man and woman. He said that a, a husband and wife are involved in a, in a contract under which husband has said that you take care of my house and I will take care of all your needs till the time wife follows that contract the husband stays with her if the wife violates that contract he can disown her now this is this is something that is not an isolated view actually we see this uh, as something that is accepted across whether they op people openly accept it or not but in practice this this contract seems to be working so you know if you could just reflect why uh, why does this keep happening or why uh, you know coming back to the labor force participation or women's role in the economy why does it keep up? So, you know, I would argue that India is unusual, as I mentioned, that we've had all this growth without. In fact, it got worse because it's a kind of growth. It's a peculiar pattern of capitalist accumulation that has actually relied on this inequality. This has been the, the period of massive growth that we all celebrate and which we as middle classes are all big beneficiaries of. It was, of course, unequally distributed. Right? We know that some, let's say the top 100 million did rather well out of it and so on, but the large mass of our population didn't really do very well. And many of them faced more insecure in, uh, livelihoods and conditions. But in fact, it's worse than that. This is a growth that relied on inequality of all kinds, by gender, by caste, by location, rural and urban, backward and developed areas, by ethnic group, by language. We are, if you like, you know, global leaders. Uh, India ko number one banana hai. We are number one in, uh, in discrimination and hierarchy. Mm. And that means that we have segmented labor markets. 
So gender is a very important part of that segmented labor market. The fact that you can make women cluster in low wage occupations, anything where women do, are more involved becomes a low wage occupation. It's also true by caste, very much so, especially you know, the existence of certain very demeaning activities which are ascribed to what are called lower caste and so on. It's true by religion. And all of this is enabled and perpetuated through a nexus of other things. There is, of course, the social norm. And you know, caste, you will agree, is still something that is very strong and dominant in India. There is the pattern of asset holding. Women don't get to hold assets. Lower caste don't have access to assets and so on and so forth. The ability to get your own assets through things like credit, which again, women tend to be deprived of. And so all of these create a broader system in which it is really very hard for women to be able to empower themselves. I'm not talking about the privileged few like yeah. myself and those in the middle class who happen to have education and also the other advantages of caste, class, urban location, professional education and all of that. Mm -hmm. But the vast majority of women are facing these multiple barriers. So in India, it's because we are such leaders in hierarchy and discrimination We've created these intersectional inequalities. And you know, capitalism isn't one thing. It responds to its context. So Indian capitalism has relied on these inequalities. We have the past pattern of growth is one that has used these inequalities to extract very cheap labor from one section and to enable a kind of expansion of profits in another sector. So it's a very unique pattern. So, you know what you're saying is is, is quite uh, um, remarkable because often people argue that even if they do not like this view, even they would say that listen, this is a very efficient system. You know, say the view that you know this compact between man and woman, you keep you take care of the home, I'll take care of outside, and this is a very efficient system, and that it has efficiency gains for the economy. So. Is that the case? Is that the case that this is the most efficient system? And if it is not, or to, to the extent that it is not, uh, how does uh, the economy lose out by keeping women in this state? Well, you know, in fact, it's the opposite of an efficient system. It is an extremely inefficient system, not only because it is masking what's really going on. I told you about this huge subsidy of unpaid labor to the paid economy. Therefore, it's giving you a false notion of labor productivity. How do we measure labor productivity? GDP per worker. We're not counting hundreds of millions of workers. You know, they're all classified as unpaid labor. Yet we are saying, oh, look, our labor productivity is increasing because we are, in fact, just reducing the number of workers relative to the GDP. Yeah, it's, so it's a lie. Our increased, our so-called increased labor productivity is a lie. If you compare it to most of the world, in fact, the other thing is that our labor productivity isn't increasing enough. It's very, very low. And why is that? It's because our economic activity doesn't grow as fast as it could have if we actually allowed more women to develop their full capabilities. Why? Because if you actually substitute, let us say, unpaid work or paid work, First of all, you're automatically increasing GDP. You are actually immediately generating incomes, which then through a multiplier effect, create more and more economic activity. You are enabling those who get liberated from having to do those unpaid chores to go out and seek activities themselves and do interesting things themselves, whether through self-employment or through you know, paid salary work or whatever. All of this adds to your income. I personally am not a big fan of those who like the World Economic Forum. They keep producing, you know, how much output is lost and so on because women are not working. And they came up with some number, 20%, 30% of GDP is lost. To me, that's, that's the wrong way of looking at it. I think what we instead should be saying is how much are we losing in terms of human potential and social potential? Because yes, of course, economic activity will expand massively. That's a given when you exchange unpaid work for paid work. That's automatic. But much more than that, you will get a much greater flowering, if you like, of human creativity. When you allow the expansion of potential 
of around half your population who are currently not given that opportunity. So it's a tremendous social waste. And it's a, it's a tremendous economic waste, which we're only disguising because we're not counting the actual number of workers. Okay. Now, there are uh, two related questions. Uh, first is uh, about you know this approach, and this is very important because now this is uh, this is perhaps going to drive uh, policy or, or 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 the approach with which we go about. When the Prime Minister Modi's speech, uh, he mentioned that uh, we want to become a developed country by 2047. Now, keeping aside all the economic parameters that sort of go with a developed country, from a from a status of women in terms of freedoms and you know, economic involvement or non-economic freedoms. How do you see that panning out, this approach? Um, you know, because we haven't seen anything substantive in that sense, in, 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 in terms of uh, uh, raising freedoms or, you know, giving agency. How do you see the uh, approach that uh, Prime Minister Modi has had till now, which is unexceptionable at one level, beti bachao, beti padhao, nobody will get up and say that this is wrong approach per se, but uh, you know, how do you see that approach? And then I would later want to ask you, you know, how can things change? But that's for a little question. And even if some historical examples we have about how did things change in the uh, rest of the country? But first, your reflections on the approach that we have at present towards women issues or... Okay, so there are two aspects to the approach. One is what is said. There's a lot of sloganeering, no question about it. The verbiage is all excellent you know, beti parhao, beti bachao, uh, empower women, blah, blah, blah. All of that is, is very well said. What is done is not just next to nothing, it's actually worse. The same day that the Prime Minister said this, we saw the release of murderous rapists who really should not have been released and then them being feted and garlanded by people associated with ruling groups. So, you know, there is a very large and growing disconnect between what is said and what is done. But let's look at government's own policy. What are they doing? They are relying on that same inequality that I mentioned to you, the segmented labor markets. What's the biggest increase in public employment in the last 30 years? It is these women workers, uh, Anganwari workers, Anganwari helpers, Ashas, other scheme workers, who are not even paid minimum wages because they're not classified as workers. They're all called volunteers. We claim we run the largest ICDS program in the world, the Integrated Child Development Scheme. Why is it the largest scheme in the world? Because no other country calls it a scheme. They see it as part of general public employment where the women are public employees who are treated like regular public employees. We run a national health mission on the back of underpaid women workers. The government is one of the biggest culprits in terms of utilizing this unequal status of women for economic benefit. So if you look at what's been happening in the past eight years, it's actually worsened. Some state governments are trying to improve the conditions, but the national position on work, women workers, scheme workers in general, has been abysmal, has been really bad. And there is more and more reliance on that, on substituting regular public employment with these underpaid so-called volunteer workers who are made to do a full uh, job without getting even half of the minimum wage. So coming to the last question then, that, you know, uh, the world in India, outside also, but more so in India, is sort of the legislative, the judicial frameworks are all dominated by men. And uh, it's unlikely that all of a sudden some change will happen. Um, and, you know, I was reading up on, say, the women's right to vote in, say, UK. Uh, there was a massive violent movement, but, you know, ultimately the change had to come from the lawmakers uh, and the lawmakers were all men. Now, how will change happen? What will trigger a distinction? Because at, at the, as you pointed out, the current juncture, the government itself is one of the exploitative <laughs> Uh, bits, you know, it's itself enjoying the benefits of lower um, pay to women. So where will or how will change come? And if there's any global, uh, you know, historical reference that you can share with us, you know, that can trigger. Uh, <laughs> <something> <laughs> on this. 
so that, that's a very interesting question. You know, across Asia, we have very, very different rates of both women's empowerment and women's economic participation. So a lot has to do with broader historical, social, cultural factors. South India and Eastern, Northeast India are quite different from, shall we say, the Hindi heartland and, and you know. So there is a lot of variation, which is socio-cultural and historical. But we cannot deny the very significant role played by active public policy in terms of reservation. Okay, I'm a big supporter of reservation, not because I think that, you know, it's the most so-called efficient way, but because it has turned out to be one of the more effective ways of getting women's voice heard. And what we do know is that having one or two women, you know, the token women, I've been a token woman in many situations in my professional life, is not good enough. You really need to have sufficient number for them to feel confident and able to raise questions, able to raise demands, able to make their needs and voices heard and felt. I've seen this in my classes. I've seen when we started having slightly, you know, giving two mic or points extra in admissions for women. We moved from having maybe 10, 15% women in a class to one third to half, to more than half. It completely changed the dynamic. You found the women asking questions, you found them able to participate much more widely and they were massively outperforming the men students. It's possible, but it really does need that initial push. So I really do believe we have to have representation through reservation in parliament, in all leadership positions, in all boards of companies, in all senior bureaucracy, everywhere. And not because, I mean, you will always, I mean, the argument about merit, we all know it's tosh, right? It's complete rubbish. So I would argue that you need a hammer in situations where the other tools are simply not working. We have, it can create a little bit of injustice here and there, but broadly we need reservations that actually bring back those without a voice, the marginalized, the deprived by caste, but certainly by gender as well. But there's a question on this issue of reservation. I want to ask you that when I see the data on say HDI or any other global metrics, or especially with women, you know, uh, whenever we talk about these gender, uh, global gender uh, parity index or whatever, we always find that countries like uh, Pakistan, India, Bangladesh would have huge political representation numbers. You know, these are, we tend to have very high political representation numbers as against say US or maybe some other countries. Uh, but overall, we tend to underperform despite that, you know, that maybe tokenism or, you know, more like even the uh, percentage of women in the parliament or in lawmaking, you know, you would find that Bangladesh or India would perf would be at a higher rank and we can increase it. I'm, I'm not debating that point, but I'm saying that why is it that even after having so many lawmakers who are women, as against say some of the more developed countries, why don't the results come through? Is that only a matter of time or how do you sort of reconcile that? No, I don't think this is a silver bullet, for sure. I mean, there's so many other things that need to happen. But I think it's an important thing. And by the way, we don't have so many lawmakers. It's still, what, 10 to 12%. Mm -hmm. yeah? And it's very much part of, you know, you come from a certain family or you have a particular patron. It's, it's very male-driven still. Where we do have representation in the panchayat level and where panchayats are functional, mm -hmm. it has definitely been seen to make a difference. But I'm thinking of countries like Chile, which got, you know, half the cabinet. Uh, Colombia, where now it's 70% of the cabinet. Um, everywhere you find where you make it a point to actually get more women, you do see a change in the culture at many different levels. And it's not because one leader, you know, having one prime minister or one president, it's not good enough. You really have to have enough of them out there to actually feel confident in expressing the needs rather than to behave more like a man than everyone else. Yeah, I mean, I remember um, the, that horrendous uh, uh, December uh, 16 rape in mm -hmm. Delhi. And I remember that at that time, if you recall, all the heads were women. Uh, uh, you know, UPA chairman, leader of opposition, Sushma Swaraj, I think, um, Delhi Chief Minister, um, and the, I mean, so I mean, just, just having one person at the top is not good might matter at some point, but maybe not enough, you know. And we need we need, need systemic uh, improvements, uh, and this issue about um, 
women's uh, uh, reservation in parliament has been hanging fire for a very long time and i remember long time back uh, i did an analysis of how it might change if you were to rotate it so mm. just like you rotate all other seats that yeah. every seat will go through that yeah. churn uh, one every third election yes. the seat will turn yeah. into a women and that will totally destroy the stranglehold that people have on certain seats so we often pride ourselves that he's a five time you know leader from a particular seat but it also might mean that for five times there's been no real opposition maybe and there's no chance for fresh growth well you know yes let me in a way kind of contradict myself also with it that you know with these also you can they will find ways to go around the system right when when lalu yadav was unable to be chief minister he made his wife chief minister for a while does it mean that she actually had agency in the way in which we've talked about it no so again it has to be much broader as a systemic thing yeah. right so um, you know i hope that uh, you know readers have and and viewers i often keep saying readers because i'm predominantly in the print <laughs> media but viewers have understood some basic issues about um, you know where do indian women fall uh, relative to uh, indian economy what is their role where they are uh, missing out or and where the indian economy is also missing out in terms of not opening the doors or not creating engendering situations uh, for women and you know now that the prime minister has talked about becoming a developed country uh regardless of whether we become a developed country or not that's a, that's in the future but if we move towards that one of the crucial bits would be both for economic and non economic reasons um the the way we you know uh, create situations for women to have economic freedom and agency as as professor ghosh talked about there are several books uh, on this issue and and just i had a, a few suggestions and just a parting shot uh, professor ghosh any book that you think that you know our readers should un, you know read on this topic well you know in terms of the global and broad historical sweep there's a wonderful book by my colleague nancy fulbray it's called the rise and decline of patriarchal systems it's by verso and i think 2021 and that's a really great overview of the whole system of patriarchy if you like There's a very uh, interesting fun book by Shreya Bhattacharya which I enjoyed. I think she makes it a very approachable issue but it's also packed with a lot of information and insight. Right. And I I for my uh, you know from my side I I would like to you know just uh, share three books. One is uh, by Helen Lewis called Difficult Women. Um this is uh, a history of feminism in 11 fights. and then there's this fantastic book called the invisible women uh by carolyn uh, criado perez um it is about how the sort of world doesn't you know no the, the data shows how the world is not sort of made for women it is a world made by men and lastly by linda scott the double x economy um perhaps some of these books you know can help us understand what the economy and we keep talking about the economy but the economy and the society and the country is missing out when we uh, restrict the freedoms uh, and the economic freedom for women in our country professor ghosh very grateful for your time and insights um thanks thanks for being on the express economist um and i hope uh, all of you enjoyed the episode if you liked it please uh, press like and subscribe to the channel and we'll see you next week thank you thank you